and welcome to this British Library Food Season event sponsored by KitchenAid. I'm Polly Russell, the season's founder and curator, and I'm thrilled to be here today in central London at the beautiful KitchenAid Experience Store for one of three events with contemporary chefs cooking and conversing with the living food legends who have inspired them. Today, we are honored to welcome Claudia Roden in the kitchen and in conversation with Itamar Shrulevich and Sarit Packer, the couple who are otherwise known as Honey & Co. Claudia, I feel, hardly needs an introduction, but she certainly deserves one. Born in Egypt to a Syrian Jewish family, she was, I'm delighted to discover, Egypt's national backstroke swimming champion at the age of 15. Claudia attended boarding school in France and her family immigrated to the UK in the 1950s. Claudia's 1968 book uh, of Middle Eastern food was written in homage to and to document the cultural and social world that Claudia's family and so many others had been forced to leave. It also transformed Western attitudes to food from the Middle East, introducing a grateful generation and generations to come to coriander, cumin, hummus, tahini and garlic. Claudia is as much a social anthropologist as a cookery writer, using food as a lens to chronicle and understand the world. She's written extensively and authoritatively about the food of Italy, Spain, and Morocco. She is indeed a food legend. And she's been an inspiration to so many in the kitchen, including Sarit and Itamar. Originally from Israel, Itamar and Sarit opened their first restaurant in London in 2012. They're known for their generous, original, delicious Middle Eastern food and have throughout lockdown been keeping their many fans happy with home meal deliveries. Their new book, Chasing Smoke, Cooking Over Fire Around the Levant, is out this year. Now, in a moment, I'll hand over to them, but I'd like to mention the other legends in this series, Jill Norman with Rosie Sykes and Elizabeth Luard in conversation with the chef, Olia Hercules. Now, if you would like to support the work of the British Library, you'll find a donate button on your screen. There's also a feedback button and we're always keen to hear from you. Please do also join us for other British Library food season events. To find out more about them, visit the food season page on the website. On this page, you'll also find details of the food season competition we're running, which gives you a chance to win a range of wonderful KitchenAid cordless appliances, a place on a virtual cooking course, and a signed copy of Callum Franklin's terrific book, The Pie Room. Finally, thank you to Claudia, Sarit, and Itamar. The recipes they cook will be available on the website. And thank you to KitchenAid for hosting. So over to you. Claudia, it's such not only an honor for us to be here in this kitchen and cook with you, it's always, always, always such a pleasure because you are one of the warmest, nicest, kindest people oh. that we know. And, uh, and a very, very beautiful lady as well. <laughs> um, we're going to cook a few aubergine dishes because it feels very appropriate for Middle Eastern food. Uh, we're going to cook one of yours, one of ours. Um, but I want to know a little bit about your first book. I think that's a good place to start. I want you to tell us a little bit about your first book, how you got to write it, what was yes. the kind of culinary landscape when you did, and yes. what happened before? Well, I was here as an art student. And then, uh, yes, the food was horrible at the time. <laughs> uh, I didn't dare to say it then. We just couldn't eat it. <laughs> but was it was just very... It um, was horrible. But now, everybody wants me to tell how horrible it was. I'm always pulled out and wheeled out to say, come on, tell us how horrible. Because now it's one of the best places in the world to be for yeah, food. Yeah. So I can say that. But yes, but that wasn't uh, enough of a reason to write a cookbook. But it was because my parents suddenly arrived with thousands of Jews. I think 20,000 came out at the same time in 1956 from because Egypt. of the this, yeah, this is from Egypt because of the Suez crisis there was it was a war and the french and english were who attacked egypt with israel because egypt had had um, nationalized the suez canal without giving them compensation and israel helped them and so the jews had to go and so suddenly 
I was such a free person, an art student in London. Uh, and then suddenly all these thousands of relatives and people <laughs> came out. Like the, and, the yeah. worst nightmare, no? Yeah. <laughs> and so for about 10 years, I was in this milieu of refugees. Uh, some of them just came to London just for a few months until they found a place that would have them because they were asylum seekers. They had to find a place. But so during that period, this is where I uh, was thrown into uh, this interest in food. I was always interested in food because I cooked for two brothers before they came. Before, as an art student, I lived with two brothers and I cooked all the time because the food was awful. But when these people came, I was uh, noticing and hearing that everybody was exchanging recipes because uh, we weren't all the same. We don't all have the same recipes because the Egyptian Jewish community was a, a mosaic of families that came from all over the old Ottoman Empire since the Suez Canal was built. And it yeah. was a really big community, wasn't it? Was it? A it was big, a thriving... 80,000, vital, uh, very, very happy, uh, in my view, <laughs> because I was happy, community. And uh, uh, we were this very, um, very uh, mosaic of people from different parts of the Ottoman world. Yeah. Uh, and in my family, three of my grandparents came from Syria. Yeah. And so we were a very Syrian community. One grandmother came from Istanbul, but the Syrian influence was so huge because Aleppo, they all came from Aleppo. Aleppo died as a... As a Trade center. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, because it had been on the Silk Road. It had been the biggest stopping center of the camel caravan trade that brought all the things from the east and then went into ships to the west. And suddenly they had no trade anymore. They, my grandparents were big merchants, the Sassoons and the Dueks. Yeah, so like big names in <laughs> the, yeah. you know, names in, in that yeah. part. And they came, and when they came, they all lived in one quarter that just opened up. It had been a marshland. And they arrived, and uh, because a man called Sakakini Pasha uh, drained the marsh and made a new quarter. In Cairo. And, in Cairo. And so all the Jews of uh, Aleppo, and also Christians and Muslims of Aleppo, came to live in that quarter. And what it was, it was it? all Syrian. And until now, when I went back, they called it, it's still called the Syrian quarter. Oh, okay. And so they went on as though they were still in Aleppo, cooking everything as still in Aleppo, and it went on into my generation. So and interesting. Of course, the, the, the Syrian food is so rich and, yeah. and so delicious. Yeah. And but what you're doing is that, yes. is what is yeah, Aleppo. And yeah. actually, it's kind of interesting Sorry that I'm... Yeah. But it's quite interesting because this is in a way happening again, not with the Jewish yeah. community, but there's Syrians that have left yeah. because of the war. And when we were just in Cairo, there's like whole yeah. communities and, and streets where the food that they're cooking is yeah. really Syrian in Cairo because yeah. they've left because of the war. Yeah. It's interesting to see yeah. the years repeat. Yeah. Well, it's not yeah. well, sad, and but interesting. Very sad. Yeah. And I've been to several events where Syrian refugees are cooking. Yeah. Uh, one in Holland, one here, one in Turkey. And, you know, they're cooking all the things that we were also trying to save yes. of our lives yeah. that makes us feel happy. You know? yeah. it, it is. It's a and memory, isn't it? That. Yeah. But uh, let's go back to that first book. So you were collecting recipes from yeah. all the random yeah. relatives that arrived. Yeah. It wasn't just the relatives because uh, we had some relatives that came from Turkey, some recipes that came from... Uh, Tunisia, from Morocco, from even there are, we married into different communities. And so it was all these very, very particular styles of cooking that everyone kept because nobody had a cookbook. They yeah. just didn't exist. Not one single cookbook in the whole of Egypt, neither Egyptian, neither of any other community. And so 
we had to remember the dishes that the Tunisians did, who are our relatives. And when we went to their house, we ate some things. But then we thought, we'll never eat it again. And there was my aunt Rachel, my aunt Regine, my aunt. And I thought, oh, we'll never have that date again if, if we don't know it. And so I just felt the strong need that we've got to collect it for us. I wasn't thinking of anybody in Britain wanting our, our yeah. recipes. <laughs> I thought they never want it because they kept thinking afterwards as I was collecting the recipes and I was telling friends, I'm collecting Middle Eastern recipes. They would say, oh, you know, <laughs> what's it's that? Is it? Yeah, I mean, I always repeat the eyeballs and testicles. They thought it was going to be, but actually... I mean, a lot of it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> no, because the thing is, these were their colonies. All the, the Jews from Aden, the Jews from a lot of places. It was their colonies. Yeah. And they had very, very little... Um, uh, appreciation of their food because when they went to their colonies they just brought English food they got their chefs to cook English food they had food sent the richer ones had food sent from from Harrods yeah. <laughs> and others would bring bags of tins of things but they wouldn't eat local food yeah. so there was and when when I had tea parties because I went to an English school Cairo it was called English school Cairo um, uh, I would tell my mother please just have jelly scones roly-poly, you know, all the things. All the Western things. Please don't have anything else because they don't like it. Uh, they, poor things, they, it's not they didn't like it. They just didn't know. Because yeah. even at school, at the school, we had just English food. The Egyptian cooks were all there. But we only got the English, English food. food. So interesting because it's flipped completely now. Yeah. Because now... Yeah. You go to Harrods or you go to big supermarkets and Middle Eastern <laughs> food is, is no. it, you know, this is what everyone is coming to eat here. So it's quite an interesting. Should well, Claudia did that. It, that's, it's your fault. It's every, every, yeah, the whole, the whole no, country is eating Middle Eastern food because of Claudia. Well, it's, no. I mean, the thing is, soon the Lebanese, it took many years, several decades before restaurants, Middle Eastern restaurants. There wasn't a single Lebanese restaurant or a Turkish restaurant just the only restaurants were Cypriots. Yeah. And the Cypriots, we, they were more like a cafe. Yeah. And we would go there and gorge ourselves. And we were so happy, just happy to be there. But it took a long time. And it took the Lebanese civil war for to bring restaurants to open because restaurateurs came and opened restaurants. And also, and then, and the Turks came and the, Iranians came and, you know, everybody came. And it wasn't me that well, they came for. Well, yeah. No, <laughs> but, but I think I do think that a lot of these cookery traditions, it's like you said, cookbook, what's a cookbook? You know, my grandma, she didn't know what's a, what's a cookbook. She wouldn't have a cookbook. Yeah. She had the recipe that she knew, that yeah. she learned from her mom, from her mother-in-law. And sorry. No, I just thought maybe we should start cooking, but... I suppose yeah, that's so kind of a, a you know, bit, let, let's, we're, all getting a bit, uh, we're, we're getting kind of thing, but we do want to cook something. Okay, so we brought aubergines. We brought aubergines. Baba ganoush. Baba ganoush. Yes. <laughs> the now a staple. Everyone, when you say baba ganoush, now everyone knows what it yeah. is. But um, I yeah. suppose it's quite yeah. a new thing for them to yeah. know. And how to treat an aubergine. How do you choose them? Yeah, they've got to be firm, firm. and you've got to be firm. lucky as well, yes. because some of them have so many seeds. Yes. And then it's, you know, it's a not, not such a nice color, but it's okay. But the best ones I heard are males because they have no seeds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so it's and all... And they're usually slender. More, yeah. you know. And it's white inside. Yes. And it means less seeds. And then, yeah, it just looks better, but... It's always good, even with all the seeds. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to do it in two methods. Yeah. We're going to so, put one on a fire directly. Yeah. And two in the grill. Okay. Do you, that, do you do that at home? Do you put it straight on the fire? How would you cook them at home to make them kind of smoky? I actually put them under the grill. Under the grill. Yeah. So this is what we're going to do. Do you stab yeah. them? 
because I would yes. stab them so they don't oh, yeah. explode. Yeah, they explode. It's quite important. Yes. So a couple of stabs, or you yes. could just run a knife along. But that's quite important so that they don't explode in your grill. Uh, so you can give it a few slits, and under the hottest kind of, that's not your one. Yeah. You stole my one. I wouldn't slit them for the fire, uh, but for the grill definitely. And then into a really hot yeah. grill. I love that way, actually, because way. it does give more the smoky flavor. But I always feel uh, I'd rather not have the mess. flame and the mess and yeah. all that. The mess yeah. is real. Yeah, yeah but the this mess is not our kitchen, real. Claudia. So yes. we, can, you know, yes. we can mess it up a bit. Uh, but they will burn and you need to give them time, don't you? It's all about yeah. them getting really, really, really soft. soft. Yeah. Yes. So important. Yeah. Otherwise, the flavor isn't there. Yeah. And the, yeah. the, the texture is yeah. very nice either. If, a, if uh, at one time when people started taking to aubergines in London, they would grill them uh, in slices yeah. so as not to fry them, to not to have much oil, but they were always undercooked, yeah. Yeah. always. And the skin was hard. And, you know, they hadn't got it right, but they kept on doing it for years. Yeah. <laughs> but they, now everybody knows how to yeah, do it well. Now, now thankfully, they <laughs> and do. Thank you. And then what else are ingredients that would go in? Once they're burnt? Yes. Yeah? Yes, it's so, so tahina. Tahina. And is this it? is this magic thing. <laughs> it's and like the magic paste <laughs> of everything, isn't it? But this is also one of those things. I remember when we came here, where, which was 10 years ago. 15. We were 15, my God. We're so yeah, old. we're old. Uh, <laughs> you're getting on. <laughs> what happened? But to um, me, you're babies. Yeah. <laughs> At least to someone, we have to be maybe We should hang out more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we would go hunting for a good tahini and we go to Edgware Road because this is, oh. this is Middle Eastern yeah. food. You yeah. know, this for us... Is the real thing. Yeah. yeah. And yes, this, let me see. This one is a Lebanese variety yeah. uh, called Al Yaman, but there's quite a lot of different varieties yeah. out there. Yeah. Out there. But for us, Baba Ganosh always with a good... Uh, Good dollar yeah. of tahini. This is a bit like uh, they used to cook. No recipes, just yeah. put some in. Yeah. And yeah. then, are you a garlic believer? Yes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not be? So, a bit of garlic. And anything else? Lemon. Lemon juice. That's, you know. Yes. This is like everything you do, salt. basically, yeah. in the Middle East has to have garlic, garlic lemon, lemon, and yeah. if you can, tahini. tahini. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If you've got that, you've all right. Yeah. If you've got it in your fridge and in your cupboard. Then everything yeah. is have, sorted. Dinner, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to chop it for me, please? Yeah. So, so, wait, let's go back to the first book. So you had all these recipes. Yes. Horrible food all around you. So <laughs> many memories. How did it come to be a book? Yeah, because I was testing them and testing them. And I was having... Uh, my ch family at the same time. I had married, I had three children, and every day we would just cook whatever we were, we were what I was trying. It took another over 10 years before the book came out because I never thought it was going to be a book at the beginning. It was yes. just for us and to pass around to people and to have. And then I became obsessed, real obsession. And everybody tells me I couldn't see anybody without asking them, do you salt the aubergines? How do you salt them? Do you put them with salt and those things? Do you put them in salted water? You know, they said they were afraid of seeing me. <laughs> because, I, <laughs> because I was asking them all the time. And, and then I also, it became for me uh, a thing to do. It means I decided... I can't just stay with the people who came out of Egypt. Yeah. So how do you find people who are of Middle Eastern origin? I would hang around, you know, like the Persian embassy. And people would say, uh, you try you want questions. a visa? <laughs> no, I've come here to look for recipes. And, you know, it was sort of more like a joke because at that time nobody was thinking anybody would want their recipes or anything. But just people sitting there would say, I've got some recipes and I've got their handwritten recipes that they gave me or that they sent me or that sometimes they invited me to dinner. <laughs> so I got so a lot nice. of, it was, it became my way of life that I continued this thing of asking people for recipes and chatting, but also, uh, you know, uh, 
I would go, for instance, I tried the embassies, like the Syrian embassy. I went to the Syrian embassy. At the time, Syria was our enemy. It was the enemy of the Jews and all that. But uh, they knew who I was and all that. But they were so charming. And my father kept saying, it's the best, the generous, the most kindest place in the whole world, Aleppo. Yeah. And then he'd say, they are monsters. They are attacking Israel, you know. Yeah. He it's would be the same so like in, yeah. But when I was there at the embassy, they would just say, this is your home, you know. This is what Arabs do. This yeah. is your it's place. It's so welcoming, isn't come, it? Yeah, yeah, come to Aleppo. Come, you know. And I kept saying, all I want is recipes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you come I'm not going anywhere, you know. <laughs> I can't. I've got three children, you know. They are... <laughs> But so, so you were doing it just for yourself? Yes and no. Because it became, you know, if I had been a scholar, I would have been doing a PhD. But because of my total fascination, I wanted to hear their stories as well. And this is why the book is full of stories, because people wanted to tell stories. Uh, you know, they didn't just want to give a recipe. Uh, you know, for instance, the Jews of Egypt. This is where I got all my stories of Goha. In Egypt, they call him Goha. Yeah. In Turkey, it's Jha. And Nasr al-Din Haja in, Tur in Turkey. Jha in Syria. It means he's the, the fool yeah. who is also trickery. But they were telling me stories of Jha. Mm. And because they wanted to, and mainly the men, wanted to have something to say. They didn't have recipes. But we wanted to remember things that I'm writing down. Yeah. And so there was, they were telling me also uh, when these dishes were cooked and this dish, uh, the full medames, that yeah. some of the people from the Jewish quarter, uh, uh, they made a full medames with the hard boiled eggs. They put it in the fire of the, of the, of the public baths. Oh, really? Uh, on Friday night. It's amazing. For Saturday. So, you know, there were all these things. And for me, it was just joy. Nowadays, people use the word pure gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because I just thought, you see, it is also my world, which I didn't really know. Because I was so Europeanized, my generation. Yeah. Yeah. My grandmother didn't speak French. She still wore Arab clothes the one who came from Syria. Yeah. And she she mocked her daughters for speaking her, French. Who and, spoke French. Yeah. And uh, and so but my generation, my grandmother who came from Turkey, she was like a missionary from France because she was a teacher of French. She had studied in Paris at the Alliance Israelite Universelle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. so Française. It was these schools that taught French to the Jews in the Arab world. Yeah. And so she just, when my mother married, she just said she can marry if they don't speak Arabic at home. <laughs> no Arabic. <laughs> so interesting. And so, yes. So we were, we, she made us feel we were French. You know, the, we were going to an English school and we spoke Italian as well. We had an Italian nanny. And we knew all the Italians. They were Slovene, really, nannies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, yes, but we felt we were French. And that's so how we So this was your connection to your really Middle Eastern roots, is finding yes. that through these yes. stories. And because my father was, he was Arab speaker. He had a, a diploma in Arabic and all that. And when he came here, he was so... Sad. I, yeah. I must say, my father was never sad. I never saw him sad. He just had a good nature. Yeah. He was always positive and always in good mood. But he wanted his own food of Syria. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and his to own make, culture, his own. Yeah. And so my mother, who had never, who had taught our cook to cook, because our cooks came, all the cooks came from villages. Yeah. They were very poor. They didn't know any cuisine, uh, and so they were taught by the families where they came, and they usually stayed forever. They would go to the village yeah. to it's have like another child. Mm -hmm. They were living, yes, they were yeah. living on the rooftops mm -hmm. in their 
small cabins or houses. Like in a uh, Jacobian building. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and that was our building as well. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they were up there. And yes, and so when my mother came in Egypt, the women just never worked. Not one single woman that I knew of my community. All the poor ones worked. Yeah. There were lots of poor Jews. Yeah. Yeah. They worked. But my community, they were middle class, they didn't work. They went to the club, they visited each other, they did petit pois, yeah. they did all that. But suddenly my mother had none of that. She couldn't see her sisters. We had a huge, huge extended family. With Everybody seemed to be our cousin or something. Yeah. But so she threw herself into cooking as her thing that get, kept her going. Uh, that she was cooking for my father what he loves because she adored him and he adored her. So that's, that's nice. what she wanted to <laughs> yeah. do. Yeah. And so there I was. Writing taking all notes. the recipes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, uh, but yes, but I also. But you didn't stop there. You started afterwards. Uh, yes. you, you, you went global. Like you, you wrote yeah. about Spain. You wrote about yes. kind of the larger Middle East, the Jewish aspects. Yes. So. I think it's because I was always asked. I think after I became the Middle East specialist um, right away, well, as soon as the book came out, yeah. or rather it was Jill Norman, who's coming later, yeah. <laughs> who actually uh, got my book to be read because yes. the first publishers did only 3,000 books and then they stopped doing any cookbooks. They just did school books. And so there was no way anybody was going to read them except us who bought all the books. <laughs> but but <laughs> then the Jill Norman uh, picked it for the, as a paperback. And then, yes, it was taken up and it was taken up in America and it was taken up. People came looking for it. Yeah. Uh, and because it was the only one. And, you know, when I looked for anything Arabic, I went to the British Library looking for an Arab cookbook in Arabic or in anything. And they didn't have a single one. And the only one they had, they said, come back next next uh, yeah. week, next day. <laughs> and the librarian just, he gave me a piece of paper, handwritten. The only thing that was there were uh, translations or uh, essays about um, uh, Arab cooking in the 13th century. Really? One was found in Baghdad, one in Aleppo, in Damascus, and one was in Spain in Arabic. Okay. And it was the, the only Arabic cookbook that people found were, you yeah. know, medi uh, uh, were medieval. Yeah. Because medieval. other than that, it was just a yeah. passed down tradition yeah. of teaching. But teachers. actually, there were, I should say, there were already cookbooks in Syria. And there was a, one of the great chefs who had written a cookbook uh, in Syria. So um, I shouldn't say that there weren't any Arab cookbook, but there weren't any at the British, the library, British library or, or to, no. to buy. I mean, I, I, I dare say <laughs> there are more than one Middle Eastern cookbook in the British library now. <laughs> now there's yes. more, yeah. But I, I yeah. just... Um... I keep being asked for quotes, yeah. even this morning. Good. Somebody says every every so often somebody is doing yes, but I don't give quotes because it's not fair. There's too many, and too I many just people. feel you know the friends that I have I didn't give quotes to, so I'm not going to give everybody. You can't no. anyway. It is. You're, I it mean, is. I think giving quotes to Middle Eastern cookbooks coming out now that's a full time job, also. <laughs> and you're quite a busy yeah. lady. But I I just wanna really pause a little bit and, and ask you because it's like you said we, when when you came all this horrible food nobody knew about middle eastern food now it's so prevalent so many cookbooks everybody wants to celebrate that culture everybody wants to know more and more and more about the tiniest yeah detail uh i want to know how you feel about that and for yeah. me yeah as far as i'm aware you were one of the first people who really made the connection between the food 
and the culture in the form in the form of a book to write it down, which is now kind of almost like a common wisdom, you know, we yeah. know now. Be yeah, because now there's all the sociology department, yeah. anthropology departments, and yeah. uh, they are asking me to give a talk to sociologists, and they're all doing PhDs and all that. Yeah. And they keep calling me a social anthropologist or social uh, a cultural something anthropologist. But, I, but, but you are, because I, I, remember, I remember reading that book for the first time and saying, wow. There's a record oh, here of really important stuff. Oh, good. But you know, the thing is, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as sociology or anthropology. <laughs> but this is amazing. You're, so, just, you're just recording history and it's... Yeah, it was recording people, yeah. yes, and what they did. Uh, and now, yes, it is fashionable. And of How course, do you feel about also that? Do you, do, you feel that, you had, that uh, do you feel that it's... You know, can you see your impact? Uh, yes. That's amazing. Yes, because the people tell me. And uh, yes, and I'm thrilled, I must say, to see what all you people are doing. <laughs> <laughs> all you chefs are elevating uh, what was home cooking um, uh, into something that is haute cuisine. And some of it succeeds fantastically, some of things not entirely. Not, not entirely. Yeah. And, but you are doing fantastically. And, and what um, uh, there has been a tradition of restaurants of the Middle East, yes. like Turkish restaurants, Iranian restaurants, Lebanese, Lebanese restaurants, of course. And they, have, they are set in stone. Yeah. Their menus. It means they don't vary the menu. Yeah. And uh, I remember going, uh, I wrote the introduction to a, a friend of mine's cookbook. She is a Turk uh, called Nevin Halici. She's now revered all over yeah. Turkey. But she went into all the villages getting recipes from the women in the event. Uh, and she uh, wrote what is called a Sufi cookbook. It's, she doesn't like the word Sufi. She calls it Mevlana, because it's particularly of Konya, where a particular where the whirling dervishes and the Rumi came and the whole uh, the whole uh, a particular type of Sufis. But they were. It was all based on food. And she wrote a cookbook with the food of Konya and the food that's mentioned by Rumi and all that. And a restaurant here, not far away from here, I forgot the name, I keep getting uh, yes, senior moments, uh, made a, a dinner for her, for her book. And we all went, and there were several journalists, and we thought, this is fantastic, because it was home cooking done by a restaurant in a marvelous way. But it was all things that they didn't have on their menu. And we said, please put this put in the, your menu. Yeah. <laughs> they said, no. Why? And they said, because people don't expect that. Yeah. They want people to come to know exactly what is there. And it's usually grills and uh, meze. But then yeah. it's your world now. You've yeah. gone into that. But kind of go <laughs> yes. in a roundabout. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I can say that you've got an advantage over them in that uh, you, as, as your Jewish side and your Israeli side, you can use the foods of other Arabs. Of all the area. You can put sug if you want. Yes. You can we put have less of a tradition to that it. That so ties you down. Yes. You're yeah. not obliged to a particular thing. You can be inventive. Well, they can't, they don't feel they can be inventive because tradition is what they're about. And tradition is what has worked for them for a very, very long yeah. time. But I think now a lot of people are interested in a surprise or an exciting way of doing something which you're going to show Which we now. are going to show I'm just going to, I was just going to say, because what we're doing is exactly that now, is we're kind of breaking with tradition a bit, where we've kind of made 
we're going to use exactly the same ingredients almost, apart from a little relish of uh, chilies and garlic uh, and a lot of lemon juice and a bit of sugar. So that's not going to go in our classic baba ganoush, which I'm going to use uh, the nice uh, aubergine for, but it is going to go in the aubergines we put in the grill. And what we... Would you want to empty that and I'll make a tahini? Yeah, or oh, actually, you can make a tahini. No, you do it because I'll do this. And you okay, do so you do that and I'll do that. <laughs> so, do you want to. You, you see but, us. But, but maybe Claudia wants to tell you something about how you're doing it because, like, yes. after years of emptying a. No, and now you got me a little bit nervous. Yeah, yeah oh, that's yeah. what. <laughs> <laughs> what you do you do? No, yeah. no well, I mean, I think... you can either peel it or then open it out and scoop it out okay, with a spoon. Yes, okay. And it's the whichever. I think now, I always used to peel, but now I scoop out for I some reason. I scoop out as well, because it's less, you, you get less yes. messy, don't you? The peeling kind of yes. is quite messy. And you could yeah. wait for it to cool down Do a bit you, more no, than that. I believe. But look, yeah. that flesh is beautiful and, and white. And people before were ho uh, terrified of the bitterness of an aubergine, but the aubergines now, there were very bitter aubergines before. Yes. Yeah. But they have been... Sort no, of, no, yeah, it's so it, it, it isn't anymore, is no. it? They are, they much don't grow sweeter, yeah. them bitter anymore. Yeah. They somehow, well, they, they, breed, have, they breed everything they out of it, don't they? Them out. It's like 90% the, chicken, yeah. For the, <laughs> <laughs> for the second one, I'm gonna make a, a yeah. tahini sauce. So rather than mixing the aubergine into the tahini, like Itamar's gonna do with a baba ganoush, I'm gonna make a tahini sauce by okay. just blitzing some tahini with salt. Yes. And yeah, I can see that you're saying tahini, and here well, it says here it's tahini. Well, here I say trina. Yeah. yeah. But if I say trina on the British Library recording, no one is know what I'm talking exactly. about. Exactly. And so, I, I feel uh, almost, uh, well, it's funny, it's a joke that uh, it depends which country is selling something. Yes. Because it was actually Cyprus that sold the first tahina. Yes. So tahina stayed uh, as... Uh, as as they pronounced it, but tahine is this is the way Syrians do, yeah. and the same with frike. Yes, frika, in Arabic frike. it's ferik. In yes. Egypt it's ferik, but because it's Syria, actually Lebanon that sells it. Yeah. So they say frike, yeah. with an e h at the end. It's so, so interesting. Uh, it is yes. Can I'm I gonna ask make you a, a noise. couple of aubergine questions? You can, yeah. but I'm gonna make so a noise. The, okay, so finish with it. You can talk, maybe. I don't know if you can. Uh, but we're just going to blitz it to a smooth tahini. And that's going to be ready for our next thing. Sorry, now you can ask so a I know, I know there's a lot. there's a lot of kind of... We were talking about tradition, but this, the burned aubergine, has a lot of superstition about it. Yeah. Like that you need to peel it where it's very hot. I don't know why, but I always do that. Yeah, I also do. I why? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> we just do. No. Yeah. So I we think, are we are yeah. married to tradition in I that think, way. I uh, think we've got to ask uh, Harold McGee <laughs> why to do it. Yeah, we get the science of it. And also, I have a ah, tradition a, where you don't use a knife. Where you don't use a knife. Yeah. You. Why not? A, oh, a no, wooden spoon. I is, chop. Do no, you chop? chop. It. In yeah. Turkey, they chop. Yes. But no, you I chop mean, we with do... the back of a knife. You do this, no. not this. No. It well, when I it when I started matter. making it, I was like, you have to crush it with a spoon. I don't know why. Oh, yes, yes. You end up by crushing it with a spoon. Yes. You start with a knife. You start with a knife. <laughs> you don't need to do it. If it's cooked properly like this, and it's a nice aubergine. No, but you did, You never heard about the back of knife? Thing? No, the back of the no. knife thing is... Uh... It was because I also do it in the way the Jews of Spain do it, <laughs> that they pour the aubergine in a colander. In a strain. Yes. So some of the juice. But not a metal go. strain. We don't have to. <laughs> no. <laughs> but so there you use the, the knife first and then the spoon. Okay, mix it so we eat something. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to, you know. No, but Claudia, I just want to say a few more things. I want to ask you a few more things. So after the book of Jewish food, the book of Middle Eastern food, you've, you've, you have become the kind of the final word in every cuisine. So your Italian <laughs> no. book. It's really hard to do an Italian book after that book. And your Spanish yeah. book is so well researched. It's so thorough. It's yeah. amazing. You, you have this yeah. kind of, on the one hand, really scholarly approach and really methodical, thorough approach. Yeah, thorough. On the other I hand, it's really joyous. And, and, you know, you can feel your love and joy for food in those books, which is why 
Thank they're you. so great, great. Thank and, you. and you know, we've certainly tried to grab a tiny the spirit of your Thank books you. in ours and in our restaurant. That's so kind. We well, always say that our entire career is a copy and paste <laughs> job of yours. <laughs> <laughs> here's that a quote. Here's a quote All for right, you. Mix when that. I come, when I come and I eat your food, I think, ah. Oh. That's so you nice. Know, well, you know so we love happy. feeding you because... And it is fantastic. Yeah. I'm and showing you the other, birthdays. the other version. Are you doing it in the other version? So this but, other version, I'm just going to basically do the same thing. Open it while it's hot and score the flesh and season it with a bit of salt. But then instead of scooping it out and chopping the whole thing, I'm going to spoon this beautiful chili garlic on. And then... Spoon some tahini on. Because there is an excitement, it makes it a dish. Yes. And it's, it's an excitement about eating it and the way it looks. But also you've got the different layers and the different fla layers of flavor. And adding and a bit of an excitement. chili, it's yes. like, you know, something. I mean, yeah. this is, don't get me wrong, I love a good yeah. baba ganoush, I have no yeah. problem. But sometimes yeah. we just add a little something. Yeah. Okay. Are you tasting first? Yeah. Okay. Nice? Yeah. Okay, go in there. So we're doing... So if I serve this to your Syrian father... One of those. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. The, yes. With the chili, I don't know if that would work that well. If I serve my aubergine dish to your, your Syrian father, would he like it? Or would yes. he go like, no, I uh, want the... He, he the likes his, uh, the way it was always. The way it was, yeah. <laughs> But look, here's another thing we do that probably wouldn't be yeah. traditional. No, no, but he is excited. He used to go. He, he yes, uh, when he was alive, he used to go to restaurants, and uh, at the time, nobody was doing what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, but he was. He came back and he'd say, you know, I saw this and I ate this. So he was curious. Yeah. But for him, I suppose he wouldn't have drizzled pomegranate molasses on his baba no, ganoush or no, put pomegranates on no. it. So things do. And when I think nobody could buy pomegranate syrup, when for years, for decades, and I had to say, if you can't find it, because there was just two shops you could. One of them was in Camden Town. Yeah. And it was called Mrs. Harrow. <laughs> and she was Cypriot. Uh, and she could, she sold everything that you could, that you wanted. But... I kept saying, if you can't find uh, pomegranate syrup, make a mixture of lemon and sugar. And you get, yeah. It works. And, uh, you know, and you could do tamarind. You could do tamarind instead because it had this sweet and sour thing. But so, yes, most of the things you couldn't. But in, I also had, went to Camden Town for phyllo, basically. Yeah. You see, phyllo is now spelt here like the like the Cypriots do. In, in America, it's like the Greeks do. Yeah. And Depends <laughs> which communities them. came. But I remember going to a place also in Camden Town, the only place where you could buy phyllo. They made it on the spot. And you'd go there and you could watch them make it. Mm. I mean, they had packets ready for anybody who came to buy. But you could go and watch. And they also made um, kadaifi. Yeah. Amazing. You know? Yes. You could watch them do watch it. it and when I go by, my daughter lives in, in Kentish Town. And so when I go by where there used to be that shop, I just feel, oh, if only. <laughs> well, it will come back one day. Yeah, no, and that, now you can get it everywhere. Okay. Yes. Not, not, you know, not made, not on made the spot, by but hand. You can yeah. buy it. But you can buy it you in every buy it supermarket. Yeah. Yes. Which is yeah. amazing. And, in, in, uh, and so many Middle Eastern shops, but also. Yes, Indian shops now are selling Middle Eastern, Middle yeah. Eastern now selling Indian. Uh, somehow everything from the East or Asian yeah. can be obtained somewhere, yeah. everywhere in England, I think. Uh, try a little bit, Claudia. I know that the first time that you came to our restaurant, I was so nervous and you were so <laughs> kind to us uh, and very oh. encouraging. But I'm still always a little bit nervous cooking food for you. <laughs> Like elegant Shall I eat it just with a spoon? <laughs> Whatever you just want. Just a bit yeah. of... Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're watching you, so no pressure. Yeah, yes. I'm not looking yeah. because I can't... Yeah. I'm just going to look away in case yeah. it's, you know... <laughs> Living legend, Claudia. Trying our food. No pressure. No pressure. Well, it is wonderful. And the thing <laughs> is, it's also... It's a different experience. Yes. 
very different experience. And it's hot. It's hot because it's served hot. Yeah. But it's also hot from the chili. Yeah, too much. And, and is it I too think, spicy? And the sweetness of the tahina and the thing is there as well. I think it's a marvelous combination. And I'm sure they're lucky, the people who come to your restaurant. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. Well, they, they definitely, we, we are owe lucky. a great debt yeah. <laughs> to you. And our diners, they owe a great debt to you. It's, mm. you know, they say living legend, like something from the past, but of course you're still working. <laughs> I'm still there. And you're still, still doing you're so still there much. And still inspiring us and every day. How lucky we all are. Thank you. Thank I'm you so the much. lucky one to have you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.